are steel rules capable of accurate measurement down to a millimeter. The graduations must stay as close as possible to the points being measured and the rule must be read as close to square onto the scale as possible. Tools that measure the difference between any two points can be divided up according to how accurately they do it. A measuring tape is useful for checking spring sag. If a distance needs to be measured with a high degree of accuracy, vernier calipers can be used. The sliding jaw grips the surfaces being measured on the outside, or for an internal measurement with these jaws on the inside. Depth can also be measured with the end of the caliper slide. Once the measurement is taken, this screw locks it in. Inches or millimetres are read here, and the fractions on this vernier That gives this the name of vernier calipers. Other calipers show the fractions on a dial or an electronic readout. This is a precision instrument that will measure down to two hundredths of a millimetre or a thousandth of an inch. Roundness and squareness sometimes need measuring. This crankshaft can be rotated in these V-blocks. If it's bent, it will show on the dial gauge. It senses slight movement at its tip and magnifies it into a measurable swing on the dial. For the highest accuracy in measuring distances, micrometers are used. Like calipers, they can measure an outside dimension, inside or depth but a different mic, as they're called, is needed for each task. This is an outside micrometer, the most common one. The object to be measured is nipped very lightly between the anvil, the part that stays still, and the spindle which moves towards it on a very fine thread. The distance between them is read off the scale on the barrel, down to the finest fraction, which is read off the scale that turns on the thimble. For inside measurements, this inside micrometer works on the same principles as the outside micrometer, and so does this depth micrometer. They give a very accurate readout of even the tiniest movement of a very finely threaded spindle. They must be kept clean, especially along surfaces that do the measuring. They should read zero when fully closed, and be checked and adjusted as described in the instructions that come with them. To check whether something is square, parallel, flat or true, a straight edge is used. It's placed against the surface that needs checking. This tri-square is a rectangular blade fitted at precisely 90 degrees to a solid stock. A simple idea and simple to use. Dividers are used to mark up circles and arcs. They are held at an exact angle by an adjusting nut. Because of the sharp points on their legs, they also give an accurate way to transfer measurements from, say, this steel rule, across to the work. Pinpoint the lines on the rule and make sure the circle has exactly the right radius. One way to make sure this leg of the divider stays put on the surface is to make a small dent with the prick punch before starting to draw. For measuring distances in awkward spots like the bottom of a deep cylinder, this telescopic bore gauge has spring-loaded plungers that can be unlocked with this screw, so they slide out and touch the walls of the cylinder. The screw then locks them in that position, the gauge can be withdrawn, and the distance across the plungers can be measured with a micrometer or calipers to convey the diameter of the cylinder at that point.
A G-clamp's name comes from its shape. It can hold parts together while they're being assembled, or maybe drilled or welded. It can reach around awkwardly shaped pieces that won't fit in a vise. And it's portable, so it can be taken to the work. In automotive workshops, clearances and narrow gaps often need to be measured. This is done with a set of feeler gauges. The markings on these strips show they're graded from fractions of a millimetre up to a few millimetres. They're used by finding one that fits smoothly in the gap being measured. Sometimes the best fit must be made by using a combination. Then the measurement is the total thickness of all the gauges that fitted into the gap. Chemical compounds help prevent fasteners loosening. They're applied to one thread, then the other is screwed onto it. This creates a strong bond between them, but one that stays plastic. So in future they can be separated with a spanner if necessary. Other compounds can be applied after assembly. Some metals react with each other and bind together. Spark plugs can do it when they're in aluminium cylinder heads. NTC's compound neutralizes the chemical reaction that can make this happen and it prevents threads and fasteners from sticking together. On some hard or shiny surfaces, scribe marks can be hard to see, so marking dye helps. A thin coat is applied to the area being marked. It dries very quickly. Then the path cut by the point of the scriber is easy to see. Engineer's Blue is similar to marking dye. It comes in tubes and it's a bit like blue butter. Sometimes in checking a fit or testing for flatness, it's difficult to see the area being worked on. By smearing a small amount of engineer's blue on a surface plate, it can be used to indicate if the surface to be tested is flat. The blue marks on the housing indicate the high areas which must be removed to obtain a flat surface. A flat surface would be blue over the whole surface. Files are often sold without handles, but they shouldn't be used until a handle of the right size has been fitted. The handle should be checked before use. It can come loose and it may need a sharp wrap to tighten it up. Clean hands will help avoid slipping. Hands should always be kept away from the surface of the file and the metal that's being worked on. Filing can produce small slithers of metal, which can be difficult to remove from a finger or hand. And acids and moisture from the skin can cause corrosion. What makes one file different from another is not just its shape, but how much material it's designed to remove with each stroke. That depends on the teeth. These are both flat files, the most common general purpose type but their teeth are different. The teeth on this coarse grade file are longer with a greater space between them. Filing this piece of mild steel removes a lot of material with each stroke. A coarse file leaves a rough finish. This is a flat file but its shorter teeth remove much less material on each stroke and the finish is much smoother. On a job, the coarse file is used first to remove material quickly, then a smoother file gently removes the last of it and leaves a clean finish to the work. The full list of grades in flat files from rough to smooth is rough, coarse bastard, second cut, smooth and dead smooth. Some flat files are available with one smooth edge, called safe edge files. They allow filing up to an edge without damaging it. 
Flat files are fine on straightforward jobs, but files need to be able to work in some awkward spots as well. A square file has teeth on all four sides, so you can use it in a square or rectangular hole. A square file can make the right shape for a square metal key to fit in a slot. This is a three square file. It's triangular in section, so it can get into internal corners. Curved files are either half round or round. This is a half round. Its shallow convex surface can file in a concave hollow or in an acute internal corner. The fully round file, sometimes called a rat tail file, can make holes bigger. Or it can file inside a concave surface with a tight radius. A warding file is thinner than normal for working in narrow slots. This is a thread file. It cleans clogged or distorted threads. It has eight different surfaces that match different thread dimensions, so the right face must be used. Depending on how hard or soft the material is, a special file may be needed. It's no good trying to file something if the file is softer than what is being filed. And softer metals like copper and aluminium can clog a conventional file. Files should be cleaned after use. If they're clogged, they can be cleaned by a tool that's really part of the family called a file card or file brush. The gasket scraper is not a true chisel. It has a hardened, sharpened blade and it's designed to remove a gasket without damaging the sealing face of the component. The scraper should be kept sharp to make it easy to remove all traces of the old gasket and sealing compound. This is the most common kind of chisel, a flat chisel. It's made of high quality steel and the end is tempered and hardened because it has to be harder than any of the metals you're likely to want to cut with it. The head needs to be softer so it won't chip when it's hit with a hammer. Safety goggles should always be used. This nut is so corroded it's frozen onto the bolt. In this case, the nut and bolt will be thrown away so a chisel can be used to remove them. A hacksaw could get the nut off, but a flat chisel is preferable. The hammer should be much heavier than the chisel so it won't bounce back or cause jarring. As the chisel goes to work, it helps to avoid damage by checking where metal chips are likely to fly. A couple of sharp blows and it's off. This is a crosscut chisel. It's called crosscut because the sharpened edge is across the blade width. This chisel narrows down along the stock, so it's good for getting in grooves. It's used for cleaning out or even making keyways. The flying chips of metal should always be directed away from the user. Taps cut threads inside holes or nuts. This is a taper tap. It narrows at the tip to give it a good start in the hole where the thread is to be cut. This piece of steel is being tapped with a metric thread to take a 10 millimeter bolt. Tapping size tables then give the right drill size for the hole. The taper tap can tap a thread right through this piece of steel. This is an intermediate tap and a bottoming tap. To tap a thread into a hole which doesn't come out the other side, called a blind hole, 
an intermediate tap is used, then a bottoming tap to take the thread right to the bottom of the blind hole. This tap wrench comes with a set. It has a right angle jaw that matches the squared end which all taps have. Numbers and letters, like engine numbers on a cylinder block, are usually made with number and letter punches that come in boxed sets. The rules for using them are true for all punches. The punch must be square with the surface being worked on, not on an angle. And the hammer must hit the top squarely. A lot of components are either held together or accurately located by pins. Pins can be pretty tight and a group of punches is specially designed to deal with them. This is a starter drift punch, starter, because you should always use it first to get a pin moving. It has a tapered shank and the tip is slightly hollow so it doesn't spread the end of a pin and make it an even tighter fit. Once the starter drift has got the pin moving, a suitable pin punch will drive the pin right out or in. This center punch isn't as sharp as a prick punch and it's usually bigger. It makes a bigger indentation called a center that'll center the drill at the point where the hole must go. That's where the name center punch comes from. A punch transmits the hammer's striking power from this soft end down to the tip that is hardened high carbon steel. A punch makes an accurate blow at exactly one point, something that can't be guaranteed with a hammer. There are some points drawn on this plate to help locate a hole to be drilled in it. A prick punch is used to mark the points so they won't rub off and scribe some intersecting lines between them. Its point is very sharp, so a gentle tap leaves a clear indentation. It's easier now to draw the lines based on permanent marks. The pin punch is available in various diameters. It's used to drive out rivets or pins. Special punches with hollow ends are called wad punches or hollow punches. They're the neatest tool to make a hole in soft sheet material like shim steel, plastic, leather or most commonly in a gasket. There should always be a soft surface under the work, ideally the end grain of a wooden block. If a hollow punch loses its sharpness or has nicks around its edge, it'll make a mess, not a hole. A drilling speed chart should be kept near the bench or pedestal drill. It compares drill sizes and metals to show the proper speed. So to drill a 10 mm hole through this piece of aluminium, the drill speed should be 1,800 revs per minute. This is a portable drill. This one has a cord you have to plug into an electrical supply. Cordless models use their own internal batteries. When you can't bring the work to the drill, you can take this drill to the work. But don't expect it to put large holes through very hard metal. The biggest drill bit that'll fit in the chuck here is usually marked on the body of the drill, along with the speeds at which it turns. There are usually two speeds, but some drills can be set to any speed within their range. These slots in the work table of this drill are designed for a drill vise. To hold something firmly and drill it accurately, it has to be secured in the jaws of the vise. Move the vise until the precise drilling point is located. Then tighten these bolts to fix the drill vise in place during drilling. A bench-mounted drill allows accurate drilling with more control, 
more so than a portable drill, which is convenient but can be difficult to guide accurately. A mounted drill can feed the drill bit at a controlled rate and the work table secures the job at a constant angle to the drill bit. Also, this drill can be set to run at different drilling speeds. This drill chuck takes bits up to 13 millimeters in diameter. When there's already a hole drilled in sheet metal that needs enlarging, a multi-fluted tapered hole drill will do the job in about the same time it takes to say it. A Morse taper is a system for securing drills. Morse taper size changes according to drill size. The shank of the drill bit is tapered and it fits snugly into the drill spindle which has a similar taper. This tang is also located in the spindle and it drives the drill. It's a quick way to change drills without constantly adjusting the chuck. Drill bits come in many closely spaced sizes. The most common is the twist drill. It has a point and a body, usually with two spiral grooves. And its shank is gripped in the jaws of the drill chuck. Screw extractors are used if a screw, stud or bolt snaps off in the threaded hole. A common type of extractor uses a coarse left-hand thread formed on its hardened body. After a hole is drilled in the center of the broken screw, the extractor is screwed in. The left-hand thread grips the broken part and unscrews it. This extractor is marked with the sizes of the screw it's designed to remove and the hole which needs to be drilled. Cutting large holes in panel steel or thin sheet metal is done by a hole saw. The drill in the center locates the saw accurately and leads it into the surface. Repetitive cutting through thick sections of material can be hard work unless you have an abrasive cut-off saw. These are rated in different sizes, usually from about 250 millimeters to 500 millimeters. That refers to the largest diameter cutting wheel that should be fitted to them. This is a powerful tool and it demands every precaution. Wear protective clothing with nothing hanging out or loose, especially long hair. Cover long hair with a snood cap and of course wear safety glasses or a full face shield. The guard on the saw should be properly in place and the power cord well away from the cutting wheel. There are enough sparks flying when the saw is working without cutting through the power cord as well. The range of those sparks should be limited by a safety screen around the job. For just one hacksaw frame there's a range of hacksaw blades to cope with different materials and situations. The hacksaw frame can be adjusted to take different blade lengths. The blade is placed in the frame and tightened to the correct tension with this wing nut. The blade must be of the right pitch, that's the number of teeth in an inch of blade. A blade with many teeth per inch has a fine pitch. One with few teeth per inch has a coarse pitch. The saw blade cuts on the forward stroke only. The teeth gather the metal being removed. They can only get rid of it when they come clear of the cut. If a blade cutting through a thick section of metal has too many teeth, in other words the pitch is too fine, they'll clog up and stop cutting. On the other hand, when cutting a piece of sheet metal, the blade shouldn't be too coarse or the saw teeth will be stripped. With the saw flat across the section being cut, at least three teeth should touch the metal at that point. After the job is done, the tension on the blade should be loosened to prevent the frame from distorting over time.
A pipe cutter is more convenient and neater than a saw when cutting pipes and metal tubing. This sharpened wheel does the cutting. As the tool turns around the pipe, this screw increases the pressure, driving the wheel deeper and deeper through the pipe until it finally cuts right through. There is a larger version that's used for cutting exhaust pipes. Making sharp, clean lines on metal requires a sharp, clean point. This is a scriber. It's made from hardened and tempered tool steel. To mark a line with a scriber, draw it towards you and keep it angled in the direction it's going to travel so it doesn't dig into the surface being marked. There are so many applications for rivets that there is a variety of types and tools for doing the riveting. The concertina rivet gun, sometimes called lazy tongs, puts larger rivets in heavy materials. Riveting pliers are convenient for occasional riveting of light materials. The rivet goes into this riveting tool which will pull this end of the mandrel back through the body of the rivet. Because the head is bigger than the hole through the body, it'll swell out as it comes through. Finally, the mandrel will snap under the pressure and fall out, leaving the rivet body gripping the two sheets of aluminium together. This is a typical pop or blind rivet. It has a body which will form the finished rivet and this mandrel which will be discarded when the riveting's done. It's called blind because there's no need to see or reach the other side of the hole in which the rivet goes to do the work. In some, the rivet is plugged shut, so it's waterproof or pressure proof. A stud is like two bolts in one. The exhaust manifold on the cylinder head is located and held by studs. Studs can have different threads on each end. On this end, there's one that's best for gripping the hole in the exhaust manifold, and on the other end, there's a thread for pulling everything together tightly with a steel nut. Thread tables show what size hole has to be drilled and what size tool is needed to cut the right thread for any given size bolt. It shows that a 3 8 inch bolt can have a coarse thread or a fine thread. This is because some threads grip metals that are brittle or soft and require more metal in the thread. They need coarse threads. A thread in a steel nut can be much finer. The thread on this engine stud is coarse on the end that screws into the cylinder head and fine for the steel nut that tightens the exhaust manifold to the cylinder head. Fine threads give more grip for a given torque than coarse threads. Screws are generally smaller than bolts. They can have a variety of heads. They're used on smaller components and often their thread extends right from the tip to the head so they can hold together components of different thicknesses. Different screws can be tightened with a range of tools. This is an Allen head screw with a recess for an Allen key. It's sometimes called a cap screw. It usually screws into a hole rather than a nut and it needs a small spanner. This is a machine screw. It has a slot for a screwdriver. Bolts are always threaded into a nut or hole that's got an identical thread cut inside. But a couple of special screws cut their own threads as they go. This is called tapping a thread and this is a self-tapping screw. It's made of hard material that cuts a mirror image of itself into the hole as you turn it. 
This is also known as a self-tapping screw, but it's designed for cutting and holding thin sheet metal, so it's often used on car bodies. Bolts are often bigger than screws and are used for heavier jobs. They nearly always have hexagonal heads that only fit spanners or Torx drivers for these Torx bolts. Often the thread on a bolt is only as long as it needs to be to tighten onto the nut or into the threaded hole. Threads are cut on screws, bolts, nuts, studs and inside holes to allow components to be attached and assembled. There was a time when there were many different thread designs used throughout the world. Modern vehicles still use a range of thread patterns, but due to standardization, it's getting simpler. Nearly all the nuts, bolts, screws and studs on a vehicle have a V-thread cut into them. For something that isn't a V-thread, look at a screw jack or a clamp. They have a square thread. The pitch of a thread is the distance between these crests. It's measured by a thread pitch gauge which comes in sets. By laying these blades along the bolt it's easy to find one with teeth that fit neatly into the thread. This pitch is 12 teeth per inch. To cut a brand new thread on a blank rod or shaft, a button die held in a die stock is used. The button die is split so that it can be adjusted more tightly onto the work with each pass of the die as the thread is cut deeper and deeper until the nut fits snugly. Nuts are often used with bolts. A nut is a piece of metal, usually hexagonal, with a thread cut through it. There are many different ways to keep it done up tightly. This self-locking nut can have a plastic or nylon insert. Tightening the bolt squeezes it into the insert where it resists any movement. The self-locker is highly resistant to being loosened by the kind of vibration that engines and vehicles experience. Tightening this style of nut distorts the insert so it only provides its locking effect the first time you use it. If you remove the nut, replace it with a new one. More secure still is this castellated nut with slots like towers on a castle. When it's screwed onto a bolt that's been drilled in the right spot, a split pin can be passed through them both and then spread open to lock the nut in place. A speed nut isn't as strong as the others, but it can be a fast and convenient way to secure a screw. Once the speed nut is started, it doesn't need to be held. The die nut is more common in the workshop. It's hexagonal to fit a spanner and it's mostly used to clean up threads that have been damaged. Some bolts and nuts need washers. Flat washers spread the load of a bolt head or a nut as it's tightened and distribute it over a greater area. This protects the surface underneath from being marked by the nut or head as it turns and tightens down. Flat washers should always be used to protect aluminium alloy. Other washers tackle the problem of nuts working loose through vibration or movement. A spring washer compresses as the nut tightens and the nut is spring loaded against this surface which makes it unlikely to work loose. The ends of the spring washer also bite into the metal. Spring washers are used more for bolts and nuts. Screws mostly rely on smaller shake proof washers. The external ones have teeth on the outside, the internal ones on the inside and one has both. Tab washers get their name from these extensions. 
After the nut or bolt has been tightened, they remain exposed and are folded up to grip the flats and prevent movement. The most common pullers have two or three legs which grip the part to be removed. A centre bolt is then screwed in, producing a jacking or pulling action which extracts the part. Power grinders come in different sizes and speed ranges. The size of a power grinder is the diameter of the largest wheel or disc it takes. Wheels and discs have a maximum safe speed printed on them. This maximum must never be exceeded or the wheel or disc could disintegrate. Every well-equipped workshop has a solidly mounted grinder, either on a pedestal bolted to the workshop floor or securely attached to the workbench. Eye protection must be worn when grinders are being used and the wheel guards must be firmly in place. A bench grinder or pedestal grinder has a rating with the size of the grinding wheel it can take. The bench vise is a plain vise that'll hold anything that needs sawing, filing or chiseling. The jaws are serrated to give extra grip and they're also very hard which means that when the vise is done up tightly, the jaws can mark whatever they're gripping. To prevent this, a pair of soft jaws can be fitted whenever the danger of damage arises. They're usually made of aluminium or some other soft metal. Some things can be awkward to grip vertically in a plain vise, so there's another style called an offset vise. A straight grinder, or more commonly, an angle grinder, is needed when the bench grinder is not appropriate. The straight grinder takes conventional grinding wheels, just like the stationary grinders, although they're limited to a grinding wheel diameter of about 125 millimetres. The angle grinder uses discs rather than wheels. During grinding, the face of the disc is used instead of the edge. There are special discs that can be used for cutting. They use the edge of the wheel and are useful for jobs that can't be reached with a hacksaw. Mounted grinders take grinding wheels in grades from coarse to very fine, depending on the size of the abrasive grains that are bonded together to make the wheel. They range in hardness too, depending on the abrasive used and the material that bonds the particles together. If a particular grinding application is required, a check should be done to find out the most suitable grinding wheel for it. This specialised wrench is an oil filter removing tool which gives that extra leverage when oil filters are tight.